So there's lots of misconceptions when it comes to violence, when it comes to how to train correctly, how to uh, deal with a lot of the issues that come up in self-defense. I, I see a lot of the questions that you guys give, um, give me all the time. And what's interesting is sometimes uh, the idea behind the question is wrong. And so I think this video uh, will go a long way in helping clear up some misconceptions, uh, how we train in you know the system that I teach and why we train that way and the results that it produces for people who really have had no experience dealing with violence before, but after training in this methodology, have a much, much better understanding of how to protect themselves and what to respond to. So I think this will give you a really clear idea of some things. Again, this is a, an interview that I did with AJ Hawk, former NFL player who uh, has a podcast, the Hawkcast. And he asked me these questions. And, you know, he, as, as a young father, he is interested in this. And we talk about situational awareness. We talk about, you know, what I studied in the correction systems, what I learned from studying alpha predators there, um, and then trading methodologies, how to train correctly. So it's a real worthwhile video for you to, uh, you know, watch. So let's get into it. And then I'll make my comments. What would be one or two common like mis misconceptions or misinformation out there that the general public has on this this topic? Uh, one is that uh, bigger, faster, stronger is you know the overriding the o overriding issue. A predator is going to look at you. As, you know if it's if if a predator is looking for a victim, they don't fear you, and so they're going to make mistakes. Oftentimes, oftentimes when they come in, they're going to give up vulnerable parts of their body. They're going to get very close to you. So the idea of being able to use a tool of violence is not one of, hey, we both get in the ring and we both know what's going on. You know, uh, it, what it is, is being able to exploit opportunities. And, and that's really what this is all about. Understanding how trauma to the human body works and then, you know, being able to, to understand how injury works. And when we talk about injury, you're talking about an injury to a, um, a structure or a sensory system of the human body. And, you know, your audience will, will relate to it because I get all of our data. This was the big thing. We got all of our data on injury from uh, sports injury data. And the reason we use sports injury data is because it's humans colliding with humans and humans colliding with the planet. You and I can replicate those types of forces. There's a lot of bad information that's out there from like, you know, car crashes. And I, there, there's stuff where guys are showing like a sidekick to a guy's femur and the femur cracking. And that picture of the femur cracking is from like a major car crash that we can't replicate those forces. So, you know, understanding how, you know, trauma affects the human body uh, through sports uh, injury data is, is absolutely key. It's your Rosetta Stone, basically, on how to protect yourself. How much of what you teach is having just having awareness? I have four young kids and I teach them every day, like have some awareness. Like, and I know it's, we'll get in, I actually do want to, we'll get into the phones and headphones after that. But like, just, yeah. is that the biggest thing? Like trying to prevent as much as I can? Yeah. You know, the, the goal, you know, the goal that I have with any client is to minimize the chance of violence ever entering your life. And you just nailed the number one thing is awareness. And, and it's, it's a really rare commodity these days because our attention is demanded in so many different areas, especially young children. You know, children now, of course, you add the technology on top of just being a kid. And, you know, I, you know I've got a seven-year-old son. I've got a seven-year-old son and twin four-year-old daughters. I have an older son, you know, uh, who's already in college. But I'll tell you what, if, if I'm trying to get a hold of my son, if we, the rare times that we let him like get on an iPad and, and play some games, I literally have to, you know, pull it away from him, look eye to eye, go, hey, hey, you know, they, they get totally immersed. And so, yes, awareness is number one. Um, you, you and awareness isn't like this paranoid. I've got to be in a certain state at all times. Awareness is basically, you know, your head's up, you're walking around, you know what's going on. You have to understand, predators look for easy marks. They don't want to challenge. They don't want to deal with somebody that's aware. They'll wait for somebody because there's, there's too many easy marks that will come along. So especially with your children, you want to teach them that, hey, you know, when you're going from A to B, it's very important that you understand what, what's going on. 
you know, what's going on around you, who's around you. Um, don't just walk in, you know, totally unaware. It's one of those things that when I train people, you know, you'll hear something like that from me and you'll say, yeah, 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 I get it, Tim. I heard it. No, you didn't. And so what I do is I'll take people and when they come and, you know, train with us or, or do anything, I show video. I show tons of video of closed circuit TV captured of people just walking around oblivious, unaware, and how quickly it happens and how quickly it changes your life. And that jars people. And then I show people, okay, if you're not aware and you get into the situation that I just talked about where you're going to have to use the tool of violence, here's what it's going to take for you to survive this. You're going to have to do this type of damage to somebody to survive this. It's deservedly so. This person is a, a criminal trying to, you know, to literally change your life. But here's the work you're going to have to do. That fundamentally changes people. When you give them that kinesthetic awareness of what it would take for them to survive it because they were unaware, all of a sudden it kicks back in, you know, and they say, and, and people, there's a behavioral change by going through this process and understanding violence that, you know, you do change. I mean, so people come back and tell me all the time, hey, Tim, I'm a lot more aware. I don't do what I used to do. I'm actually, you know, I'm not taking the same routes to work uh, every day because, you know, it was kind of risky. You know, I, I was going through an area that it was convenient, saved me about 10 minutes, but hey, it's a dangerous part of town and I don't do that anymore. Uh, I'll go out of my way to, uh, you know, to make sure that I avoid any potentiality to bring it into my life. I'll let things go as far as, you know, um, road rage incidences and things like that. Things that they would have participated in before after being educated and seeing that, hey, these are all gifts to you. Anything that you can literally talk your way out of or just dismiss is an absolute gift. You don't want to have to take it to the next level because it literally can change your life in seconds. Yeah, it makes me think of some of the stories you hear of college kids when, say, they get into a fight outside a bar, kid punches a guy, he falls down, hits his head in the curb and dies. I mean, that's manslaughter now. This yeah. kid, it just a an innocent college fight, and probably just two drunks, can alter your whole – those are the, the stories that always scared me. Do you have a lot yeah. of parents that send, like, their college kids to you? Yeah, I have a ton of kids that come, come through uh, that way. You know, a lot – it's popular. It's either, you know, boys or girls. Um, the boys – they're ready for it right about that age. Girls, I'll train as young as 11. Sexual assaults happening at ever earlier you know, years. Girls don't have the fascination with violence that boys do. They don't have to navigate kind of the locker room, you know, violence that you and I had to do. You know, we socially use violence to communicate with each other. We'll knock each other around. We'll do stuff like that. There's acceptable things. And you kind of were talking about it just now in that incident. Most of those types of encounters are kind of a you know, socially aggressive situation. Nobody in that scenario meant to have somebody die. You know, that wasn't the intent. But what I try to educate people on is once you cross the physical plane with somebody, all bets are off. And I will show, you know, video of the epic bar brawl and two guys really slugging it out, going at it, boom. And at the end, they're bloodied, they're battered, but they're up and around and they're walking away. I'll show then right next to it another vi video where it's exactly what you said one guy there's there's an exchange one guy clocks the other guy that guy's hit, head hits the concrete he's dead instant manslaughter and what the juxtaposition is you just saw this epic battle where guys were going you know at it full force and everybody walked away and then you see this other incident where it, it just in, a, in an instant both were avoidable you know, and that's that's the main thing. If I can get to young guys, you know, to that, because we had, um, you know, I, I, I do we do a lot of work in the special operations community. And we had a sniper um, in Arkansas get into an altercation with a guy who happened to be a male nurse. He's kind of like a, an EMT male nurse um, guy. And they were arguing, you know, I think it was a, I, if I'm correct, I believe it was over a woman, you know, a big surprise there. But it was like four in the morning. And the same thing, you know, the, the nurse ends up clocking the sniper, the sniper goes over, bangs his head, he's dead, you know, instant, instant, instant manslaughter. Two young guys, alcohol, testosterone, just a bad mix. And now, you know, one guy's facing manslaughter charges, the other guy's dead all over something that was completely avoidable. Um, whereas I define for everybody else, you know, when is the time, you know, when is the time? The time is, like you said, 
you're devoid of choice. The story that I use to illustrate that is a story from, I think it was almost 12 years ago now. It was in London, and uh, it was I was over there training at the time. And a young lawyer got off of the subway, the tube st stopped there, walked through a nice part of London, decided to cut through the park. Not as dicey as it sounds, but he walked through the park. Two guys attacked him at knife point, jacked him up against a tree, asked for his watch, his wallet, his um, briefcase. They gave him everything. You know, he gave he gave these guys everything and they left. Everybody loves that part of the story. Second part is as he's lead, as he's walking away, those guys come back. The, the, when they come back, they're coming back at a, at a rapid pace, head down, knives drawn. They ran him down, stabbed him to death. People heard, you know, from the condos that were close by, they heard the young man yelling, why, why, why? I gave you everything. I gave you everything. It's my goal for any client that I train to understand the difference between those two situations. The first situation, it was definitely aggressive, but it was social aggression. And the reason I say social aggression is because there was some communication going on there. And in a situation like that, you can choose not to respond with violence. You can sit there and say, you know, I think this is just a robbery. I am going to go ahead and comply here. And I'm pretty sure once I, I give these guys what they need, they're going to leave. The second situation where there was zero communication, you notice the heads were down, the knives were drawn. Boom. I need my people to understand that that's a social violence, a social meaning, no communication, and they're coming at you. They need to understand those cues. I provide training environments, and I talk about it in the book, the difference of what type of training environment you need for, you know, a social, you know, training. And essentially, it's just no communication. So the difference, you know, I told you guys, I told you that I'm right across from one of the big MMA studios here, um, I, and I love going over there. They play kick-ass music. It's fun to watch the training. The guys go at it. And what's really cool after is they help each other up. They give each other bro hugs and they compliment each other on, on what they're doing. And there's great sportsmanship that I see over there. Hard training, but great sportsmanship. If you then came over to my place, there'd be zero music. There's no sounds other than people hitting the mats and, you know, coming back up and doing their strikes and, and getting everything done. Because the environment that I'm training my people for and one is not better than the other. It's just we're training for a different skill set here. I want them to recognize a social. They know when they're down on the mat that their their training partner is not going to sit there and give them a helping hand and, and, and pull them back up because that's not going to be out there on the street. And it's not like this hardcore thing where we make angry faces or anything. It's just very much, you know, emotionless. And you're just you're totally focused in on your targeting and what you're doing. Um, and it's emotion and it's, it's, it's mentally draining to train that way, but that's what people come back and tell me was the greatest gift that they had people, unfortunately, you know, guys you know, and girls that train with me that have had to deal with violence after training always tell me the same thing. I recognize day social. I recognize the lack of communication. I realized, Oh, this is it. This is the real thing. Um, I had a 52 year old dentist who trained with us. He, go, he walks in on a Sunday to do some work at his office. As he walks in, there's a tweaker in there breaking into his, um, his, uh, his, his dispensary, you know, going for some of the drugs. Um, the dentist is there. He's, he walked in to an area where there really was no exit for him. The tweaker sees him, draws a knife, and comes charging at him. This guy recognizes, oh, damn, this is it. He charges the guy who is charging him with a knife because he recognizes I got to get over to my tar. Anything that's going to change anything in my favor resides in that guy's body. And I got to get there right away. He goes over there, slams the guy in the side of the neck as the guy tried to, to stab him. He then grabs his head and he starts jamming it into the door hand into the, um, the doorway, you know, just bam, 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 drops the guy. He was just about to stomp on him at that point because he was, you know, he knew the guy was trying to stab him when he recognized that the guy was out cold and he was non-functional and he was no longer a threat. He was able to get the knife, pulled away, called the cops, tied the guy up and was able to, you know, make the report. This guy had never had a fight in his life. And what he says was, he said, the thing that got me into action was I recognized this was, there was no communication. This guy saw me, drew his knife and just charged me. And he goes, I realized 
I, I, the only thing I could do is use, use violence. And he goes, the only reason I know that is because of the way we trained at that point. And again, this guy's not a superhuman guy. We didn't teach him, hey, take the head and you know hit it into the door jam. He just recognized how to use the tool of violence. He recognized, hey, I've got control of them here and that's a really hard surface and this might help me out. And he was able to improvise and, and, and use all that. But it was the fact that he recognized a social. He didn't try to talk to him. He didn't try to engage. Hey, what are you doing here? Why are you here? He recognized this guy's coming to you know do grievous bodily harm to me. And, and so that's the differentiation. And what's interesting is when I take, say, like a really well-trained athlete, I've had, you know, I've had NFL guys, I've had baseball players, I've had a lot of guys train with me. And what's what's amazing about training, even world class MMA guys, you know, when, when they train, what's cool is those guys are so used to training correctly, meaning, you know, putting, putting the methods in that once you give them these principles, they're really they, they adapt faster than any of my other students. I mean, they're they're very on it. So it's not a question of, you know is one you have to do one thing or the other this is just something that enhances you from a self-protection standpoint it doesn't take away from anything that you already have um so it's it's kind of nice in that manner but again it if you can get that and and the focus of the book is really to engage your mind on the subject of violence and change it because that's where the biggest change happens the physical training i, I can train anybody that way i can train you in all of that stuff but if I can't get your mind to, to wrap around this subject correctly, if you're going to have all these fantasies or misnomers about, you know, the tool of violence, then, you know, you're going to be facing, I assume the threat you're going to be facing is going to be one of these worst of the worst that I met in the prisons. You know, I, you know, I assume that's what you're going to be up against. And I want to give you, I can't give you anything better than a 50, 50 on that, but most people don't have a 50, 50 right now. Most people have a 5% chance of doing something. And the reason I say 50 50 is because in violence, it's usually the first person that gets an injury that walks away and everybody, you know, until that first collision happens, everybody has a chance. Wow. That book that he talks about, you know, that guy, Tim sounds amazing. Wonder what it's called. Oh, I don't know. Yes, a shameless plug for my book, When Violence is the Answer. If you haven't got it, you really like it. You get it on audiobook. You get to hear me talk. Fantastic. Um, but anyways, we cover all those principles in, in the book, and uh, they are really important. Um, AJ asked some really good questions there. I hope it helped clarify a lot of the, you know, the misconceptions that are out there and what's important when you're training to save your own life. Um, and what's really important is to make sure that you really clearly think about what you need to respond to and what you don't respond to. Um, I'll go more in depth on this. I've got a whole other concept that I want to cover with people because of some of the questions I'm getting from you folks. And I'm a little concerned, but I'll, I'll get those together and I'll make sure that I clarify, uh, points for you because I really, if I can keep you from having to ever deal with, uh, the need for self-defense then that's a great life that you want to live. Now, listen, folks. Please subscribe to the channel. If you haven't subscribed, please share this with your friends. Tell them about it. Anybody in your life that think you that thinks you uh, could use some really good self-protection information, I would appreciate it greatly. Keep those comments coming and hit the notification bell. Talk to you all soon.